Ready, Kim? Good morning. Welcome to church. Uh, we'll start off this morning by singing Are You Washed in the Blood? Uh, hymn number 259, all the verses. Um, if you want to come help lead songs, go ahead and go right ahead. be seated. Uh, a song is a call to worship, to uh, remember the cleansing power of Jesus' blood and being washed in his blood and asking, are you, are you washed in the blood? And those of us who, by faith in Jesus, believe that he paid for our sins are washed in his blood. And so it's a good song to start with this morning. And I'm glad Eddie chose it because it fits in well with uh, end of the sermon today. So um, let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Um, I want to pray for uh, my wife, Cassie. She's not here today. She had a rough night with her leg last night, and so she's in a lot of pain this morning. So uh, keep praying her leg heals. Uh, I'll pray for keep Becca Kegel in our prayers. I think that's um, one that Lou told me about, right? Okay, she had cancer. She's 22. A um, couple little kids, and it doesn't look good. So I want to keep praying for them and their family. Keep praying for Sue and Roger Wicklin and their family. Um, keep Karen, Karen in prayer for chemo and, and those other ones who are doing some uh, chemo treatment. Uh, Gwen's friend Jane. Um, keep praying for Dorothy as she gets up and around and able to move about. Um, also for... Darlene and just uh, 
all those who have requests. Um, we want to keep them in our prayers this morning. And uh, I think that's all the prayer requests, unless someone has one. Let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning uh, fully realizing that um, you're in control, Lord, and there's uh, nothing we could do on our own power. We have to be washed in your blood um, to be saved from our sins, and we depend on you every day, and that's why we come to you with our many requests and prayers dependent upon you, having faith that you'll you'll hear our, our cries, you'll hear our requests, and so we come lifting them up before you. We pray for uh, Cassie's leg, a- asked that you would help it continue to heal, um, and uh, it's been getting better, but we ask that uh, sometimes it doesn't and uh, hurts pretty bad sometimes, and so pray that uh, you would heal her, her leg. And pray also for um, Becca Kegel, Lord, that you would your hand would be upon her and her family in a, a mighty way, Lord, that uh, whatever your will may be, that um, you would teach them and guide them and give them grace and, and peace and uh, your mercies, which are new every morning, Lord, that they would rest upon them. We pray for healing for her. Uh, Lord, if it be your will, we would ask that you would please heal her. Uh, we pray for Sue and Roger Wickland and their family as they... Uh, it's only been a month, and so they, they still, uh, I'm sure, continue to mourn and, and pray and ask uh, for help for their family. So I pray also for the Christie family uh, in the same way, also for uh, those affected. Um, Lord, we pray for, uh, lift up those families to you in the recent shootings in the same manner, all who have uh, dealing with losing a loved one. Um, Lord, we entrust them to your care. We know that you take good care of your people, Lord, and, but maybe some of them weren't, uh, didn't, don't believe in you, and so we ask that um, they could receive comfort through you, that they could hear your word, hear your gospel, and come to know you if they didn't, uh, and um, receive peace that transcends understanding uh, which we have in you. Lord, we also pray for um, Darlene, that you would help her um, with her uh, ear and balance and everything that uh, she gets, has been going through. Uh, continue to pray for her, ask for help. Pray also for chemo treatment for Karen uh, and for um, Jane. Ask that, uh, and for Nicole's medical requests, Lord, ask that you would help them uh, all with that. And we lift them up to you as well, uh, as well as um, all the personal prayer requests, Lord, that we have listed, we lift them up to you as well, Lord. We each need your help personally in our lives, and so we come to you, uh, not literally on our knees, but on our knees as we're asking for your help and and, um, coming to you requesting for what we need uh, in full faith that you'll give it to us. You we give our children bread when they ask and not a stone, and so you, Lord, are able to give us even better gifts. And so we come asking all these requests before you. We lift them up to you and trust them to you, Lord. We ask that you would bless our time together, bless this service today. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing uh, A Child of the King um, from the handout, which I don't have. Neither of us know this one, so (coughs) bear with us.
Um, for announcements this morning, uh, it's jail ministry Monday nights. So I keep praying for those guys and gals, um, those who are in jail, those who will be ministering to them. Um, Herman shared with me that they shared the gospel this last Monday, and uh, there's a man who accepted the message and uh, uh, received the gospel, and he's saved now. So uh, it's an effective ministry. You know, we don't always get to see the results that night, but it's a joy to hear that they got to uh, this Monday night, and so uh, we were able to give them a Bible, and um, I wasn't there, Herman was. He was able to give them a Bible and um, share the good news with them, and he accepted it, so... Uh, it's a Bible verse about the angels rejoicing in heaven when one person, when one sinner turns, turns to God and uh, receives the gospel. So um, it's a it's a good thing to rejoice in. Um, Want to just keep uh, the rest of our announcements. Bible study here seven o'clock on Wednesdays, um, and then uh, <clears throat> we've been trying to do a Lord's Army Bible study. Uh, we didn't do it this last. Uh, week Ray and I have been the ones showing up and uh, we're gonna we were gonna do Saturday but we decided to reschedule so I'll be keeping in contact with those who uh, want to go and setting a date and time and all that so um, Grand Village there's a service August 25th at 2 p.m. Uh, first Sunday of the month September 1st next month will be communion and um, keep on your calendars September 22nd uh, potluck after church and uh, Sisters Afternoon Crafts. Um, I think that's it for announcements, unless anybody... No, I think we're good. All right, so let's sing the last uh, two songs. Sing Blessed Assurance, hymn number 67, all of the verses. Number 439, Sweet Hour of Prayer, all the verses.
Okay, so Labor Day weekend, uh, a couple families going up to camp, shingling and uh, shutting down the water and just getting things done up there. So uh, if you're able to come up there, we'd appreciate the help. Well, um, <clears throat> today we're going to continue in Hebrews 9. We were in Hebrews 8 last week. Um, first, let's pray before we, before we begin. Lord, we uh, thank you for answering our every prayer. Um, thank you for those times of sweet, sweet hours of, of prayer. Um, Lord, we come to you this morning uh, asking that you would help us learn um, from you today, that you would teach us by your spirit, that you would um, help me as I speak, Lord, and it would be uh, your words that people would... Um, not be distracted by uh, whatever it is that might distract them, um, different things for each of us. And so pray that you would um, help me, help everyone, uh, Lord, that the, through the reading of your word today and uh, preaching of it today that we would uh, learn what it is that you have for us today. And we, we ask this this morning in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so continuing today in chapter 9. Uh, last week I gave a pretty detailed overview of what we covered in the book of Hebrews so far, the letter so far. Um, today I will I'll not go into that in length, and we're just going to pick up where we left off last week. Um, last week we covered chapter 8. It was about a new covenant. Uh, previous to chapter 8, um, in briefness but not at length, um, we already covered and had read about um, a better messenger. Uh, Hebrews 1 um, tells of Jesus, who's a better messenger, who brings a better message than the angels. Speaks of the superiority of Jesus um, and a new priesthood, which is his, uh, which supersedes the old priesthood. And then in chapter 8, <clears throat> and we discussed a new covenant. We also discussed chapter 8, verse 5, that all of those Hebrew things, the, the tabernacle, the priests, the law, uh, the covenant of old, they were all given as reflections, as shadows and images of the things to come. Chapter 8, verse 5. Who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee, thee in the mount. And so we discussed the new and better covenant which Jesus bring, which took the old covenant and wrote it upon our hearts rather than on old stone tablets, rather than being in ordinances and, and ceremonies, the covenant agreements, the things of God and his instructions, his laws were written upon our hearts through Jesus. And if we have faith in him, then this is done. And he guarantees this better covenant, this better deal with God, uh, so to speak. And so we enter into chapter 9, discussing those things uh, which had been given. So we'll uh, pick up with reading chapter 9. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and, uh, and a worldly uh, sanctuary. Uh, the word there in Greek is, is hagion. It means holy place, a worldly um, holy place sanctuary. It's the first room in the tabernacle. For there was a tabernacle made, the first room that is wherein was a candlestick and a table and the showbread which is called the sanctuary the, the holy place and then after the second veil the tabernacle which is called in Greek Hagion of Hagions the holy of holies the holiest of all which inside there behind the curtain in the second room had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant which was overlaid round about with gold wherein was the gold pot that had manna and Aaron's rod which had budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And over it the cherubim of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we can now speak particularly in briefness, not at, not at length. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second the priest went alone, once a year, and not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors uh, of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying 
that the way into the holiest of all places, the Holy of Holies, was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. In the first tabernacle, which was a figure, verse 9, for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meat and drinks and diversity of washings and carnal ordinances imposed upon them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come as a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of a building, not of that building, the temple, uh, neither by the blood of bulls and goats, um, goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works in order to serve the living God? And for this cause he is the mediator of a new testament, a new covenant, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions, for the payment of the sins that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be death of the testator. A testament, a, a will. Uh, for the testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator live. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood there is no remission, there is no removal of sins, no forgiveness, and so it was therefore necessary that the pattern of the things in heaven should be purified with these, so the pattern of the things in heaven, the, the, all the stuff that he sprinkled, all the vessels of ministry was sprinkled with blood, but the heavenly things themselves with a better sacrifice than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands. He didn't enter into the holy of holies behind the curtain, uh, which are figures of the true. It was a figure of the true, but he entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And not that he should offer himself often, the same way that the holy priests entered into the holy place every year with blood uh, for others. For then, otherwise, Christ would have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself and is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. <clears throat> and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now, I want to move through the topics that broader topics that stick out in chapter 9. It's going to take us two sermons to do that. Um, but the broader um, portions of chapter 9 uh, would be imagery and ordinances of worship. That's verses 1 through 6 and, and a little bit of verse 7. And then the next topic that we'll cover will be cleansing and, and cleanliness. That's going to be verse 7 through 14 and, and, and verse 15, which we'll get through today, which will then shift us to the next topic next week of a will and a, and a testament, uh, <clears throat> which is verses 16 to 22. And then after that testament is confirmed, that will is confirmed, then we'll focus on Christ's sacrifice in verses 23 to 28 of chapter 9. Uh, we might get into chapter 10 a little bit because that sacrifice of Christ continues through verse 14 of chapter 10 still focuses on Christ's sacrifice and then on what his sacrifice did. Um, so if you like to write headers or notes, um, those would be your four headers for chapter 9. Imagery and ordinance, cleansing and cleanliness, will and testament, and then lastly, uh, Jesus' sacrifice. So first let's start with imagery and ordinance. 
verse 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. I said as I was reading there the Greek for the word sanctuary is, is hagion. Hagion means a holy place. That, that first covenant between God and Israel uh, had regulations for worship and a place of worship, uh, a hagion, a holy place here on earth. And there were two rooms in the tabernacle. They, God told him, Moses to make a tabernacle after the pattern he showed him, and he told him to have two rooms, a holy place where they went every day, and then a holy of holies, a, a most holy place that they went into once a year. Now in that second room, excuse me, in the first room was a lampstand, a table, the sacred loaves of bread, and that place was called the, the holy place, the, the sanctuary as King James translates it. Then after that, after the second veil, there's a tabernacle which is called the holiest of all. Behind that second veil and behind that curtain, there was a second room, a, a tabernacle, uh, as it calls it. And in Greek, the word tabernacle is skene, or maybe pronounced skenu. Uh, the word in Hebrew uh, there, which is the equivalent word, is miskan, which means dwelling. So it's a, 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 a tabernacle, a dwelling. The, and the verbal form of, in Hebrew of miskan is sakan, uh, sa sakan, which means to dwell. So what I'm saying there, I don't mean to throw you off with the language, but it, to tabernacle is to dwell. The second room, this tabernacle, was the dwelling, the resting place of God's presence on earth. That's why they had to, they couldn't just enter it whenever. It was only once a year and only through blood. And uh, it was where he, where he seconded, where he dwelled. It was his, um, the Hebrew there is Shekinah, his it was the na name they had for his presence based off that verb. And so they could only enter into that m most holy place once a year. And this holy of holies uh, behind the second veil uh, only once a year and only by blood. That's verses 6 and 7. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always every day into the first tabernacle doing their service to God. But in the second one, they went just the high priest, not every priest, just, just one, just the high priest, and once a year, and not without blood. And what he did was he offered sacrifices uh, for himself and then also for the people. In, the, in this most <clears throat> holy place, in the second room, verses 4 and 5, we see um, the signs of the first covenant, the signs of that covenant, which was a golden censer, an ark of the covenant, you think of that, this a covenant. This is the Ark of the Covenant, the signs of the covenant. It was laid with gold. It was uh, of most precious value, wherein was the golden pot that had manna. It showed God's provision for the people, the manna he gave them in the desert to feed them. It had Aaron's rod that budded. They all, all 12 leaders put their rod up there, and Aaron's was the one that budded. It showed God's approval over his leadership, and it had the tablets of the covenant had the, the Ten Commandments in there, the, the law that we went over from the first covenant, the laws which were on stone tablets but through the new covenant are written on the heart. And then over the Ark of the Covenant, over these things that were inside the Ark, the cherubim's glory was overshadowing uh, the mercy seat. Their wings were told to be made, crafted in a particular way to um, show the mercy seat. And so... Uh, that was God's seat of judgment. God decides whether uh, it, when he judges, he judges rightly. And those who uh, receive judgment or mercy, that's why it's called the mercy seat. Um, and so there's only one way that we receive mercy, and that's through Jesus. And so he fulfills this second covenant. There's, those were the signs of the first covenant, but now there were signs of uh, the second covenant, which, which we will get to. And so we don't, even the writer of Hebrews said, let's not get into these really small details of, uh, or smaller details of the first covenant in detail now, just that when all these things were in place, you should know that there was a priest, they went into the holy place every day, and they only went into the most holy place once a year. It was by these regulations that the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place was not freely open as long as the tabernacle and the system that it represented were still in use. And so moving through the text, verse 9, they were an illustration unto the present time, pointing to the present time. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer 
were not able to cleanse the consciousness, consciences of the people who brought them. They weren't able to make perfect those that brought them as it pertains to the conscience. The conscience, the sin, guilt, it wasn't, wasn't cleared. It didn't make them perfect by, by these physical regulations. They were, these regulations were of an old system that deals only with food and drink, meats and uh, drinks, and various ceremonial cleansing, uh, different kinds of washings. They were physical regulations that were only in effect until the time of Reformation, until a better system could be established. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered into the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands, and is not part of this created world. It was with his own blood that he entered into that second one. It wasn't the blood of bulls and goats that the high, old high priest entered in by. It was Christ's own blood, which he entered the most holy place in heaven, and he secured for all time our redemption forever. The end of verse 12, by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having et obtained eternal redemption for us, having secured our redemption forever. And so that's, that's the first topic with the imagery and the ordinances of worship, that all these things pointed to Christ. We read that in chapter 8, verse 5, that they were uh, shadows of the heavenly things. We see that in um, chapter 9, verse 9, they were the... Uh, or verse 10, they were imposed until a certain time. You see, all, the, all these older things, they were a figure of the things to come. That's the way that it says it in verse 9. Uh, they were part of that old system, that, that food and drink that I just mentioned, of various cleansing ceremonies. They, they, were they were those physical regulations, and they were in effect until a better system could be established. Now, I want to drive that point home. Uh, we're on topic 2 now. Cleansly, cleansing and cleanliness. So you think of two kinds of, of cleansing. You might think of cleansing in terms of sin. Okay? You have sin guilt. That's what it's talking about. You know, our conscience before God. This old system couldn't make us, our consciences couldn't make us perfect, couldn't clear the conscience before God in terms of sin guilt. Then you have another kind of cleansing that is ceremonial. You have washings and, and all these instructions, the meat, the the drinks, the, you know, Numbers 19 is a good example. There's a, if someone dies, they have to have a priest come. The priest comes, brings them out of the camp. Well, then if they touch a dead person, you're ceremonial and clean. So they take a, a heifer and they, they burn it. They take the ashes. They sprinkle it in water. They take hyssop. They sprinkle everything. Okay, now you're ceremonially clean. And if you didn't get the washing, then you had to stay outside the camp for a day. And then after a day, then you were ceremonially clean again. There's, there's, there's a difference there. It wasn't a sin to touch a dead person and then that cleansing made them free of sin. No, it was just a ceremonial uh, cleansing. It pointed to that th in order to be cleansed from ceremonial uncleanness, they needed a sacrifice, the blood needed to be sp spilt, and so it pointed to the better system that would come, but never ever did uh, the blood of bulls and goats atone for sin. It was, it was, a, it was a given by God to point to the new um, in better way. And so I want to drive that point home. I don't want anyone to think that the blood of bulls and goats actually atoned for sin. If, if it had, if it could, then we wouldn't have needed Jesus to die. We wouldn't have needed Jesus to atone for sins. If the blood of bulls and goats could have covered it, Jesus died for nothing. No, it was that the blood of bulls and goats actually did not atone for sins, but rather were covering coverings for ceremonial uncleanliness. You see, no one has ever been justified by the law or by the holy ordinances that God gave. But rather, as we read last week, the righteous shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2.4, Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, Hebrews 10.38, the righteous shall live by faith. We're going to get into Hebrews 11 in a couple weeks. And in it, we go through each character in the Bible, the faith of Abel, the faith of Enoch, the faith of Noah, the faith of Abraham. It says, by faith Abel, by faith Enoch, by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith Isaac, by faith Jacob, by faith Joseph. All of those lived by faith. And that was before a temple system was ever given through Moses. Moses is the next one after Joseph. 
And so sometimes we look backwards at all of this ceremonial stuff. We look back at the law that was given. And we say, yeah, yeah, that's how they were made right with God. In the Old Testament, they all had this system. I mean, well, but we forget that that wasn't even given until Moses. It was by faith, Abel, by faith, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. They all lived by faith before the temple system was ever given. And then those after Joseph, as Hebrews 11 verse 23 starts with Moses, Moses and, and those after him, he was given the law, he was given the ordinances, he was told to build the temple with a hagion, with a holy place, and a veil, and a, and a holy of holies, which can only be entered into once a year. And all these things Moses did, chapter 8, verse 5, uh, to the pattern that God told him to do. Who serve as an All these things serve as an example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was told by God when he was about to make the tabernacle, and he told them to make them as the pattern he showed them in the mount. And so all of these things served a purpose. Um, Moses set all that up. He gave it to the Israelites. He did all that. That's chapter 11, verses 23 to 32. By faith, Moses did this. Uh, chapter 11, verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, by faith his parents hid him three months because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. They saw that he was a, a male child is what that means and they were not afraid of the king's command to kill all the male babies. And so by, by faith his parents hit him. And then by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by on dry land, which the Egyptians were saying to do were drowned. When the Egyptians tried to do that, they were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down and they were compassed about seven days. By faith the harlot, Ray, the prostitute Rahab, perished not with them that believed not, when she received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? Do I have time to tell you of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Japheth and David and Samuel and all of the prophets who by faith? It was always by faith that people were saved. None of it, none of them by ordinances were saved. Not a single one. The scriptures don't say that and that was never the reason for the old system to be given. Rather, verse 8 of chapter 5, they served a purpose. Verse 9 of chapter 9, they were a figure for the time of things to come. They were, they were regulations which didn't make people perfect. It didn't clear their conscience before God. They were an old system that dealt with food and drink and, and certain various ceremonial cleansings that pointed to a better system, a different one. There were matters of ceremonial cleanliness and cleansing. It was not, the ordinances were not of righteousness by faith. These ordinances of uh, priesthood and temples, they were ceremonial cleansing and cleanliness which pointed forward. And so verse 11 on, <clears throat> but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come, we went through that before. Christ came as high priest in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Levi, not in the same order of priests of before, but in the order of Melchizedek. It was by promise, not by law. It wasn't by law. It was, it was through God's promise. And so Christ, being this high priest of the good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not, not one made with hands, not of this building, not of, not of this building of the temple, and, and not by the law, not by the shedding of the blood that the law told them to do of bulls and calves, but by his own blood. By his own blood, the sacrifice of his blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Eternal redemption was obtained through Christ's blood, through Christ's sacrifice, and not through the blood of bulls and goats. Uh, blood and bulls and goats was about the ceremony, was about the ceremonial cleansliness, not the cleanliness of being cleansed from sins. And people don't misunderstand verse 13 and, and a lot of times in that. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, that meant that in numbers when they 
sprinkled that on the people who had touched a dead person. Now they were ceremonially clean. It wasn't that they had sinned and they sprinkled the blood and now they were not, no longer a sinner. It wasn't that. That's a misunderstanding of verse 13. The, the sprinkling sanctified the purifying of the flesh. It was about ceremonially, ceremonial cleanliness. And so I wanna, I'm going to read through um, some Old Testament passages here, some, some, and then some New Testament ones uh, where Jesus mentioned uh, the same things because I think it's often that the blood of bulls and goats um, being mentioned in the same breath of, of salvation and being mentioned with the Old Testament and wondering how all of that actually works. Um, I think that um, some think that they had to do this. They had to do this, all these rituals, all this blood and, and bulls and goats. Otherwise, they weren't forgiven. And, and that's just not what the Old Testament scriptures teach. It, didn't, it wasn't what God told the people. Psalms 40, verse 6 to 8. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll, I did desire to do your will, my God, your law, within my heart. God, when he speaks to his people through the prophet Isaiah, we read about it a while back, uh, where he said, come, let us reason together, though your sins are as scarlet, I will make them white as snow, white as wool. And we read that verse from Isaiah, it's speaking about the forgiveness of God, but let's read that fuller passage. The fuller passage is Isaiah 11, 9 to 18. Now, except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, so that God left the people of Israel as a very small remnant and kept those of the faith. If, and so if he hadn't have done that, except if the Lord have, had not left us a very small remnant, then we should have been as Sodom, and we would have been like unto Gomorrah. So hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain obligations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and the sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity. Even the solemn meetings that you have, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me, and I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment, relieve the impressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. They had this idea that if they, they could do everything that was wrong and somehow still come with all these Sabbaths, all these requirements, they could fill, fulfill the requirements but not really care about what was right, and that's not how it works. God said, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though, though your sins are as scarlet. They shall be white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be like wool. God does offer forgiveness. He left that very small remnant, and if he hadn't, they would have been just like Sodom and Gomorrah, and they would have been totally annihilated. And see, this is not something new. It wasn't something that he told them once. It was in the Psalms. It was in Isaiah. It was in an Amos. God tells the same thing very clearly to the people of God through the prophet Amos, that it's not about ordinances or animal sacrifices. Amos 5, verse 21 to 24. I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. Instead, rather, but... Let the justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When God spoke to the people through Samuel, prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel 15, 22, and Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen better than the fat of rams. Psalm 51, 16 to 17, For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it you would not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, 
broken heart and a contrite spirit, O God, you will not despise. Proverbs 21.3 says, To do righteous and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. It was never about offering the sacrifices to God in order to be clear from sin. He has been clear to the people of God that that was not what it was about. He spoke through the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 7, 22 to 23. For in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, go back to Egypt right after when they were in the exodus in the wilderness when they received all these commandments. In the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I did not speak to your fathers or command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this was the command I gave them. After they crossed the Red Sea, when Moses spoke to the people through God, he said, Obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people and walk in all the way that I command you that it may be well with you. Jesus quotes some of these verses. He quotes Hosea 6.6, 6, Matthew 12.7. He was talking to the Pharisees. He was talking about ordinances. He was talking about the Sabbath day, which was ordained by God. <clears throat> and they were being critical of him because he had picked some corn and ate it. And, they, and uh, he said to them, verse 7 of Matthew 12, But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, then you would not have condemned the guiltless. He says very much the same thing, quotes the same verse, Hosea 6, 6 and Matthew 9. Matthew 9, verse 13, they said, Why is Jesus eating with publicans and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. And when he tells them to go and learn this, he's saying, go read Hosea 6.6. 6. That's exactly what it says. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. The prophet Hosea was telling the people, Hosea 6.1, he says, come, let us return to the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. In the third, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. He's even talking about Jesus coming there. Then we shall know, if we follow on to the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come to unto us as rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. So he says there's, there's a cloud, there's something showing that something's coming. There's these ordinances showing that something's coming. And Jesus is the rain. He comes down, the rain is coming. But you guys... O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is a morning cloud which the rain doesn't come, and the early dew that just goes away. Therefore I have hewed them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as light that goes forth. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Hebrews 9, 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified the purifying of the flesh. If that gave you ceremonial cleansliness, if you were made ceremonially unclean, and if they removed this ceremonial uncleanliness by, like I talked about Numbers 19, them going outside the camp, sprinkling with water, if all of that, if the blood of bulls and goats uh, sanctified the purifying of the flesh, that removes ceremonial uncleanliness, then how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, verse 14 of chapter 9, offered himself without spot to God, how much more shall he purge your consciences from dead works to serve the living God? It's for that reason that he's the mediator of the new covenant, of the new testament, so that by means of death, his death, which he offered and entered into the holy place by for that by means of his death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament so that those transgressions could be people could be redeemed from them forgiven of them under the <clears throat> for those by means of his death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under that first covenant they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance the promise of forgiveness of sins eternal inheriting eternal life and the point here, through all of these scriptures, is that animal sacrifices did not pay for sin. And they never did. God wasn't satisfied with the animal sacrifices. He didn't give them as instructions to the people so that the people thought that they were clean and okay before God. 
It was not so that they had a clear conscience with God from sin guilt. Verse 9, that, that those sacrifices couldn't do that. They could not make them perfect pertaining to the conscience. They couldn't be free from sin guilt through these sacrifices. Hebrews 9, 9 says that. Eternal redemption always came by a Christ. The Greek word Christ is the Hebrew word Messiah. Redemption always came by a Messiah. Eternal redemption always came by a Messiah, always by a Savior. Hebrews 11:26. Moses esteeming the reproach of the Messiah, of the Savior, greater. So he didn't care about Egypt. He looked forward to the reward from the Savior, from the Messiah, and through faith he kept the Passover, the sprinkling of all the things that God asked him to do to show the signs of the covenant. He demonstrated it by faith. It was by faith that he did them. And so Hebrews 9, verse 15, for this cause Jesus is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance, the promise of eternal inheritance, the thing that Moses looked forward, the recompense of reward, the inheritance of eternal life from God, from Christ. The promise is that if you don't believe in God, the good news, the gospel that we preach, the promise is if you don't believe in that, you can. The promise is, is that all who believe in Christ, that Jesus paid for our sins, will be saved. That is the promise of internal inheritance. That is the redemption from our transgressions, the forgiveness of our transgressions, of our sins, through Jesus our me mediator. He's the one who mediated it for us. He's our go-between between God. He paid for us. He said, I'll redeem them. Here's the payment, my blood, for the transgressions, so that we will receive the promise of eternal inheritance. That's the that's the gospel that we received. That's the gospel that we preached, that Jesus died for us. He, was, he died for us. He was buried, and he rose again on the third day in victory over sin and death. He, he died for us and paid the payment. He rose again in victory over sin and death. That's the gospel we received and that we preach. And so, <clears throat> continuing, after verse 15, okay, that's how it works. And so, because of that, there's a will and testament for where there is a testament, verse 16, there must also be a necessity of the death of the testator. That's the, the force of a legal document. You say, you had this first covenant, you had the signs of it, now you have this new covenant, and you had the signs of it. Jesus had a will, and he said, this is how it's going to work, this is what you're going to inherit when I die. And it was once through his death that the will was put into effect. We're going to get into that next week. We're going to talk about the will and the testament. We're going to talk more on Jesus' sacrifice as the, as the scriptures going forward continue with. But for now, today, we know, verse 11, that Christ came as a high priest of good things to come. He came by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. It wasn't made with hands. It was neither by the blood of bulls and goats. It wasn't by goats and calves, but it was by his own blood that he entered into the holy place and obtained eternal redemption for us. The scriptures say that as many as believe, he gave right to be called the sons of God. The righteous shall live by faith. I read you the Bible verses that say that again and again in the scriptures. It's the drumbeat of Hebrews. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. It's a drumbeat of the entire Bible that salvation is by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God so that any who believe gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. It's a gift that we have to receive. And if you don't believe that, just hear this now and believe it. Your salvation depends entirely on God offering his mercy to us in his Son. And he made the offer for forgiveness through the death of the Son. For if the blood of bulls and goats and heifers made people ceremonially clean, how much more shall the blood of Christ... God, the Son of God, who is perfect, without spot, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Just think of how much more the blood of Christ will purify your consciences from sinful deeds, from acts that lead to death. King James says in verse 14, dead works. Dead works, which are works which are dead. They're acts that lead to death. How much more will the blood of Christ do through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience and purify your consciences 
Verse 9, the old sacrifices couldn't do that. They couldn't make you perfect. They couldn't clear your conscience. But how much more, if those sacrifices could make you ceremonially clean, how much more will the perfect sacrifice of God purge and purify your conscience from sinful deeds, acts that lead to sin? It will. That's what his blood does. His blood will wash away our sins. So if we have in faith in Jesus, his blood will wash away our sins. That's the gospel. We believe that. That's what we as God's people believe, and that's why we sing songs about it. We sing songs. We're going to sing a closing song. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There's a little newer song I really like. Uh, Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. It wasn't the blood of bulls and goats that cleansed sin guilt. It never was. It's a misunderstanding of the system that God put into place. Rather, it was the blood of Jesus shed on the cross, his body body broken for you, his blood poured out for you. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. This This cup is the new covenant in my blood, the new testament. This is my will and my testament. This is my promise to you that his sacrifice paid for our sins once and for all, and any who believe it will be saved from deeds that lead to death. We will be saved from our sins. Any who believe that his sacrifice paid for our sins once and for all will be saved. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the way that you set everything up perfectly. Uh, You gave us uh, examples so that we could understand You gave us examples that pointed uh, to your perfect plan. You didn't just overnight do something. You worked with us throughout history. You worked with mankind throughout history so that it would be clear, so that we could understand, so that we knew that we knew that we knew. And it was undeniable that you could say something and then 700 years later fulfill it, and we knew that that was God. That's the only way it could have been. So we thank you that uh, you foretold of the giving of your son. You foretold... Uh, of um, Jesus coming and mediating a better covenant, a, a, a full and final payment for, the, for our sins once and for all. And so we thank you that you sent your son to die for us, Lord. We thank you that you've shared the gospel met- message with us that as many as believe it uh, are, are saved. And, and uh, thank you for just the simplicity of verses like John 3.16 that You so loved the world, you gave your only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you that your blood has washed away our sin. And we thank you, Jesus. Pray this in the name of the Father and Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's close with, uh, as I said, hymn number 266, Nothing But the Blood.